The Bible, is it relevant to today? Is it old fashioned? Is it out of date? David, tell us, why should people believe what the Bible says? I think that we have got to show that the Bible is relevant, that it's a book that can change our lives. Uh, we can model our lives and many of the teachings of Christ in this book. And it's something that is excellent in order for it to be a, a life manual for us. But it's more than that. And we have to be sure that it is authentic, that it's actually real, that the stories that we read in it actually happened. So how do we do that? Uh, because as children, many of us went to Sunday school and we were told these stories in a very, very simple way, in a way that our little childish minds could understand. But of course, there are many people who has no church background, has no religious background, or has a different religious background, but they still have heard some of these Bible stories. Sometimes even a movie's made into it, like Noah's Flood or something like that. So they hear all these stories and they wonder, well, did that actually happen? Or is these just hand-me-down stories? Is this just folklore? Are, are, are these just legends and myths? Because every ancient civilization has had its own myths and legends and its own folklore. So why would the Bible be any different? Why would this book of Judaism and Christianity, well, why should that be different than any other ancient civilization? But I think that we need to start with a quotation from the Bible that will help us to understand. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to his young protege, young Pastor Timothy, he said that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Whenever we hear that word inspiration, in modern terms, we think of a singer was inspired or some playwright was inspired to write some drama, or some inventor was inspired. In other words, we were thinking that they were brilliant at something, that there was a moment they did something that was really wonderful and exceptional, inspired. <clears throat> but whenever the Bible talks about inspired, it means something entirely different. The word inspired in the original, <coughs> excuse me, in the original language that the Bible was written in is, was Greek, and it's theonustos. And Theo is God, and Eustace is where we get pneumatic from, and it means air or wind or breath. And so it literally means inspiration in the Bible is God breathed. So Paul was saying to Timothy that the scriptures are God breathed. The Latin is inspiro, is where we get inspired from. So it's God breathed. And the Apostle Peter, if I may quote from, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Peter said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so this was something that the Bible writers are saying that was inspired, that was breathed by God, that came into the mind of the writers. It's not something they decided one day, oh, I must write a story, I must write a, a book about my travels. Paul could say, I must write about my missionary trips. This was something that was put into them by the Holy Spirit to recall and to write and to record for us. So it's not like William Shakespeare was inspired. This is something that came from heaven that God actually did for men. Some of what you've said is very good, David, but it may be a little bit theological for some, a bit complicated. Can you simplify things a bit for those listening today? Yes, I believe I can. The, the, the Bible is a collection uh, of many books written by many people over many years. But yet, it has got one continuous theme that runs throughout from Genesis to Revelation. And if I can modify what the writer and preacher C.W. Slemming uh, said, he said, imagine if you put together in one volume such books as the Magna Carta, the history of Plato, the songs of Wesley, the writings of Karl Marx, the religion of Buddha, the theories of George Bernard Shaw, and the prophecies of Nostradamus. Do you think that that would be one harmonious, harmonious whole, that there would be a theme from beginning to end? I don't think so. And yet the Bible is one volume, and it's a collection of 66 books. It's a library, actually, of 66 books in one volume. And each of those books, there's a theme that runs throughout them from beginning to end. And they were written by 
about 40 different people over a period of about 1,500 years. And they're written in different lands. Most of these people actually never met in their lifetimes. And, and they were written from places like Asia and Europe and Babylon and, 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 and Egypt and, and different countries at different times in different generations. And yet in spite of that, they are one harmonious whole throughout from beginning to end. And so the Bible contains 66 different books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, and yet they all dovetail together. It's interesting that in the compiling of the books of the Bible that God used different people. Uh, people for like kings and statesmen and farmers and fishermen and scribes and uh, shepherds and, and, and all kinds. And some were highly educated. Like the Apostle Paul was uh, a great academic and he was a great theologian. He had a tremendous forensic mind. And when you read his writings, you have to really think when you read his writings. And yet there's the Apostle John, who was just a simple fisherman, uh, who had a small vocabulary. But when you read his book, it's easy to read, and yet it's very, very profound. Some of the greatest things that are written in the Bible, it was John who wrote them. And so, even though this is an ancient book, and even though it's full of prophecy and poetry and philosophy and history and geography and biology and astronomy and everything that's in there, yet it all must be true. It has to be authentic because if we can't believe part of it, then how can we trust all of it? The book was handed down not just orally but in written form. And some people may say, well, if copies had to be made from copies, because actually we don't have any original manuscripts. All we do have are copies of copies of copies. So some people may say, well, would that not be prone to making mistakes? Would there not be lots of contradictions because they're copies of copies of copies? Well, actually, whenever you know the lengths that God went to to make sure that each copy was absolutely as perfect as a human being could make it, then you begin to see that God wanted this to survive and he wanted it to be hand down, handed down to us in a literal way that we could read, that we could trust, that we could feel this is real and authentic. Uh, for instance, uh, the first five books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch, uh, what the Jews call the Torah, the five books that Moses wrote. It's interesting to know that the scribes and the copyists uh, who, who copied these it, it took them 15 years to meticulously copy. And not just every word, but every letter of every word was checked from five different scrolls. And so great lengths were taken to do this. And in fact, three more years after it was completed, that the scribes and the copyists had to reread these to make sure there was no mistakes and to correct any that was there. I've heard mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls. What are those, David? The Dead Sea Scrolls was a tremendous find. Uh, it happened roughly about 1947. And it was uh, shepherd boys in the area of uh, Qumran, which is just close to the, a mile or so from the Dead Sea. And there's lots of caves there. There's about 11 caves. And one of the boys went into one of the caves and he found in clay jars, didn't know what it were at the beginning, we only found out later. We found in clay jars uh, writings which were from the Hebrew Bible. In fact, there was parts of every book in the Hebrew Bible except the book of Esther that were contained in these jars. And one of the greatest finds in these jars was a scroll of the book of Isaiah. Now what makes this interesting is this, that it was probably about... Uh, the second century before Christ, whenever these were found. And uh, the earliest we had before this was in the 12th century AD. And so here we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Isaiah, found to second century BC, and we already had some copies from the 12th century AD. So we could go back now a thousand years 
and compare these two scrolls. And whenever they did that, they found that they were very, very accurate. There was very, very few mistakes made. And even any little mistakes that were made, it might have just been a letter, it might have been one word, but it made no difference to the text of the book of Isaiah. And so that shows you the painstaking work of the scribes and the copyists. And it shows you how God overseen this to make sure that what we would get today would be as accurate as it possibly could be in order uh, to help us. And although the Bible is a, a spiritual book, and it is a spiritual book, uh, but yet it, it, it's full of other things. It has to be true historically. Because if we couldn't trust the history of the Bible, then we can't trust any of it. And some people say, you know, for years they said, well, there was no such people as the Amorites. But then archaeology are finding, all the time they're finding that the Bible actually was literally true, that there were these nations, that there were these kings, and they lived in these generations. And so archaeology is proving it. And there's scientific things in the Bible. Even if it's not a book of science, they weren't scientists that wrote the Bible, but they're scientific statements. And if they're not true, then we can't trust the Bible. But actually they are true. And some of the scientific statements in the Bible, and we can't have time to go into it in this series, but some of them, which were ancient, are only found out in, in, in these last few generations to be accurate and to be actually true. And so trying to comment on that would be a very difficult task. Now, mentioning again the work of the copyists, the scribes, to give you an idea of, of the work that they did, the Talmud, the Jewish Talmud, uh, gives us several things about this. And if I just may quote these. It said, The parchment had to be made from the skin of a clean animal, prepared by a Jew only, and must be fastened by strings from clean animals. Each column must have no less than 48 or no more than 60 lines. The ink must be of no other color than black and had to be prepared according to a special recipe. Now listen to this. No word or letter could be written from memory. The scribe must have an authentic copy before him, and he had to read and pronounce aloud each word before writing it. He had to reverently wipe his pen each time before writing the word for God. And he had to wash his whole body before writing the sacred name Jehovah. One mistake on a sheet condemned the sheet. If three mistakes were found on any page, the entire manuscript was condemned. Every word and every letter was counted, and if a letter were omitted, or an extra letter inserted, or if one letter touched another, the manuscript was condemned and destroyed at once. The old rabbi gave the solemn warning to each young scribe. He says, Take heed how thou dost do thy work, for thy work is the work of heaven, lest thou drop or add a letter of a manuscript, and so become a destroyer of the word. And the scribe was told that even if a king entered the room while you were copying and he spoke to you, do not answer him until you have finished that page. And so that lets us know that God went to great lengths in order to make sure that what we had was authentic. And of course, in spite of that, Johnny, many people still over the centuries has tried to destroy the word of God and has tried to say it's a lie and have tried to uh, decry the word of God. Voltaire, who was the French writer and atheist and philosopher, here's what he said. He says, 12 men started Christianity, but one man will destroy it and I will be that one man. He said, within a hundred years, only a few old Bibles will be found in museums. 100 years passed. And his complete 91 volume of his works were sold for 50 pennies. <laughs> and the same day, the British government bought a portion of scripture of the Bible called the Codex Sinaiticus for £250,000. <laughs> so it was the greatest price that was ever paid for any book up until that day. Thomas Paine, an infidel, he once said, I've gone through the Bible as a man would go through a forest with an axe to fell trees. I've cut down tree after tree, and here they lie. They will never grow again. Thomas Paine thought he had demolished the Bible, but since he crawled into a drunkard's grave in 1809, the Bible has gone on to be still the greatest selling book in the history of man. Joseph Stalin, the bloody butcher of Russia, he came to power in the, after the death of Lenin in the 1920s. 
And the first thing he did was he instituted a ban the Bible. And he wanted to erase every trace of God or the things of God from the Soviet Union. He made that a pledge to wipe it from the minds and hearts of every man. Did that work? Well, recently, and I mean very recently, the Russian government has asked for Bibles to be introduced into schools in order to help the morality of its pupils. And so the Bible continues, no matter what men say. Uh, a man went into a blacksmith shop and he was watching the blacksmith. And he noticed how the blacksmith had a rhythm, uh, how that he tapped his hammer once and then he tapped it twice. He tapped it once and he tapped it twice. And he noticed that each time he did that, he was tapping the anvil twice as much as he was tapping the steel that he was trying to forge. And so he said to the blacksmith, he said, sir, can I ask you a question? He says, how many anvils in your long life as a blacksmith, how many anvils have you worn out? The blacksmith said, none, but I've worn out many hammers. And the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many, many hammers. And even this very day, there are people who will try to destroy the Bible. People actually were burned at the stake for writing the Bible and for preaching the Word of God. But it still stands today as the greatest selling book in history. The Word of the Lord endures forever. Jesus says, my words will endure forever. If that has encouraged somebody to review and to look at the Bible again, where would you suggest that they start? It depends what stage you're at in your thinking. Uh, generally, the first place to start on any book is the first page, and you work your way through. But if you were sincerely thinking about becoming a Christian, I think it would be good to start in the Gospels. Uh, and I think the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of John would be a good place to start. And uh, of course, the, the four Gospels, some people say, well, they all look much the same. Well, the first three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, and that's two words, sin and optic. An optic means see, and sin means together, to see together. Uh, and so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are many, many similarities. Each of the writers, writers they look at the thing in slightly different ways. And actually, that's a good thing. Because if this had been a conspiracy, that the disciples would write these stories, surely they would have got together and made sure their stories were absolutely straight. But they didn't do that. Each of them wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And some included some details in the story that the others left out. So it's good to read those three together. Uh, the Gospel of John is, is different. The Gospel of John stands out from the other three in that it, it focuses mainly on the last few weeks of Christ's life. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And, uh, but all four together are just great just to read through and to get what it was like to see Jesus Christ on this earth in his day, the miracles he performed, the teachings he gave, uh, his life on this earth and the temptations he faced and his crucifixion, all these things. So that's where I would probably start if you were sincerely looking uh, to look into the Word of God, maybe to become a Christian, to start to read the Gospels.